Welcome back to Kentucky Route Zero. We've just come from the mines. Conway has a hurt leg, and I believe it's um, Shannon who's driving the truck right now. So let's head back to the bait shop and see if we can meet up with Weaver? Is that their name? Does it mention it here? Ah, we'll see him. I'll confirm their name when we get there. Conway and Shannon pull into the bait shop parking lot. Same description as before, of course. Enter the side door to Shannon's workshop. The walls are lined with cheap metal shelves loaded precariously with vacuum tubes, awkwardly shaped metal casings, and coffee cans full of electronic components. Shannon leads Conway to the back of the room where a few TV sets in various states of disassembly are set up on a rough wooden table. She flips the switch on the power strip. They're all plugged into and the TV sets tremble to life. Oh yeah, it is Weaver. Let's stare at the TVs for now. A ghostly white wobble flickers along one screen in a rhythmic pattern. Another is just snow. A third... A small security monitor in the middle of the table is oscillating between different shades of black. Wonder if anything will change if I keep watching. Nope. Ask Shannon about Weaver. Shannon points to a small security monitor on the table. The image on the screen is just black, but it seems to be fading slowly, almost imperceptibly, between different shades of black. Shannon tweaks a few knobs in the side of the monitor, but the picture doesn't change. Let's keep looking at it. Oh, no, 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 I just pressed leave. Whoops. And now I just accidentally drove away. Well, let's try that again. <laughs> that was a disaster. The screen is a cavernous black. It hums and swells at the pace of the tide. Conway loses track of the workshop's walls. They could be inches away or miles. He is adrift on black water traveling swiftly towards a rocky shore. There should be a lighthouse or a buoy by these rocks. It's too dangerous. Shannon switches off the power strip. Weaver's not here. Oh. Well then, I guess we gotta head to the house. Where exactly was that? It was, uh, <clears throat> left at the burning tree, right? Yeah, it was down this way. There it is. Right there. Already been to the museum? There's some horses out there behind the house. Remember the horses you you and Lyset and Ira had? Yours didn't like to sleep in the barn either. I just want a pet blue all day. Oh, right. We don't walk very fast anymore. Well, we'll hobble up this dirt path. stop. Oh! Oh, Shannon's helping us walk now. <laughs> Thank you, Shannon. It's a nice little touch. I 
I'd like to read the names on that graveyard. I'm guessing one of them's Weaver. I've already seen that description before. What is this, though? There's nobody buried here, you know. It's decorative, I guess. Or it's art or something. I don't know. What are the names on the headstones? Noah Kowski, Padilla. Uh, I don't know those names. Maybe the people who lived here before? I know when they bought this property, it already had a house and everything. Or maybe they have some other symbolic meaning. Oh, and look at that headstone. Marquez. I used to think that was for my parents. Now I don't know. Oh, that's right. Didn't Weaver say that there was a house already here and they had to, like, build over it or replace it, right? So maybe that was the... Maybe the people who, uh, whose names are on those headstones, the other people. Maybe the old house was their house. So, this is where she was? Yeah, makes sense. This is where Weaver and her parents lived. They took out a bunch of loans, you know, and had this place built. Do you have any debts? I never really had any collateral. Something to be said for that, I guess. My parents were like that, until the company store found a way to get to them. For my dad, it was tokens to run the fans and air purifiers. For my mom, it was canaries. Two solutions to the same problem, but they sure sounded different. Weaver had debt too. A lot of it. All tuition. She said she was a mathematician or something. Yeah, she studied some esoteric stuff about... something about using math to translate between Spanish and English. I think eventually Weaver put those math skills to work on all the red numbers in the family checkbook and got a clear sense of just how hopeless their situation was. So she left. I guess she just drove away in the middle of the night. They woke up in the morning and the car was gone. Never came back. Until tonight. Someone else told me to come here and talk to her. Huh. Okay, I guess we two aren't the only ones she's been talking to. Oh, that's not something you see every day. That old TV right there, well, that is a damned antique for you. I had a model like that in the shop once, but I had to sell it off to make rent. Most painful decision I ever made. Say, do you mind if I open it up? Looks like the dials are all corroded, and the screen is leaking light a bit. Come on, I bet Lysette would never forgive you for letting a specimen like that fall into disrepair. Oh yeah, these tubes are all messed up. Looks like they've been in a swamp or a cave or something. There's moss growing on this one. That's okay. I have a few spares in my bag here. Here, I pulled this one out of an old computer monitor. Just needs to be recalibrated a bit. Okay, that ought to... I should be seeing something now. Are you seeing anything? A uh, little bit to the left? Damn, okay. Uh, here, I think the contacts are dirty. And don't go telling my customers I clean up old vacuum tubes with spit. <laughs> there, just gotta turn it north-south and... There's Route Zero.
Josh is downright creepy. Ah, I was thinking that might be the end of Act 1. Act 1 is Episode 1, right? I guess we're about to see. What is this? Letter. Attention, Lula Chamberlain, regarding your application. Wait a minute. Lula. Lula. That's a familiar name. Where did I hear that before? What were they talking about with Lula? Ah, I can't remember exactly. But yeah, that's been mentioned. Thank you for your application to the Gaston Trust for Imagined Architecture's Annual Fellowship. We received a record number of applications this year, over 100 in total. And regrettably, we can award only one fellowship position per year. As you know, our review process includes a multi-phase blind committee analysis of portfolio submissions, as well as a... You didn't make it, is basically what it's saying. Mm -hmm. Our panel did not select your application. Sincerely, Dr. Carl Stone Norden, Architect Gaston Trust for Imagined Architecture. Below the printed text is a hastily handwritten note. Sorry for the condescending form letter. Love your work. Unfortunately, I just do the mail here. Aw. That's a nice note. Throw it in the wastebasket, or fold it up, and put it in her handbag. Let's put it in her handbag. Lula opens a folder on her desk labeled Proposals. Oh, right, it's an option. Um, yeah, Proposals. Lula sorts through documents, all printed on a fading letterhead reading Bureau of Reclaimed Spaces. Proposal number one. Site, hospital, proposed use, auto dealership. Proposal two. Distillery. Graveyard. Basketball court, used as a kennel. Hmm. Like, is this part of episode, or act one? Or is this some interlude, or is this... I wonder if it just, like, rolled straight into act two. That wouldn't surprise me. I think it might just be an interlude, though. Uh, let's see. Let's do proposal three. Basketball court abandoned due to hazardous increase in stray dog population. Already full of dogs. Yeah, it's turned into a kennel. Endorsed. Now we're down to two. Let's review proposal one. Hospital closed due to repeated sanitation violations. Auto dealership sanitation requirements comparatively lax. Small operating rooms could be repurposed into offices. Large cubicle-style administrative offices could be repurposed into showrooms. Um. Uh, I mean, sure. I don't. I don't see any particular reason to oppose it. Sh sure. Rick clears his throat. Busy. Uh, it's not important. Oh, okay, great. Uh, really great, I mean. Uh, sorry, that's not what I meant. Um, did you get my note? About the office party? I'm going stag. Stag? I don't know what that means. Oh, yeah, that's... I didn't mean... Hey, I'm probably not going anyway. Uh, lots to do, you know. A lot of new drafts, so... So, uh, how'd your application go? I was in the mailroom and I saw you got a letter back. Sorry, I don't mean to pry, I just saw. It's fine, Rick. I'm not going anywhere. How's your goldfish? Ah, oh, it was an interlude.
so... Is this what was on the other side of the Route Zero tunnel that we took? Is this the Bureau of Reclaimed Spaces? This leg is getting kind of stiff now, Blue. I don't know if that's a good sign. Well, I hope it is. <laughs> Maybe someone here can point us in the right direction. Yeah, it looks like they're still open. Must be the night shift. What do you think they do here? Hmm. Looks like an office building. Yeah, an office building in a cathedral. This is weird, but... Do you think we're inside or outside right now? Uh, I mean, last I saw, we went into a tunnel, so inside. Yeah, inside a cave, I guess. Just feels like it's still outside, since it's not man-made. Well, maybe someone around here has a better sense of direction. Okay, so I guess we've been driving around for a little bit, it sounds like, and we're kind of lost. End of the line. Seems that way. Not for us, I hope. I love the heavy thuds of the lights going on and off. It kind of sounds like somebody dribbling a basketball. Anyway, kind of hypnotic. Oh, can we not go down here? Where can I go? The way the camera panned over, it made me feel like I could do something over here, but... I didn't see any interaction. Hmm. -mm. Am I just supposed to walk around the barrier, I guess? There we go. Oh, I see some people up there in the top left. Marianne. Well, here you are. Better late than never, I guess. Just unload the whiskey over there by the elevator. I'll figure something out. Wait, is this... the... destination? The Dogwood... Lane or whatever? Uh, we're actually a bit lost, ma'am. Or, go with Shannon. Um... Let's go with Shannon. Wanna settle a bit? I'm actually pretty busy, but... Sure, what's up? He says we're inside, but I think we're outside. Wow, okay. Um, is that like a philosophy thing, or are you just lost? Yeah, I guess that's a bit philosophical. Huh. Okay. I wouldn't say you're dressed like a philosopher. How am I dressed? You work like me. 
I take care of the heating and cooling and watch the front desk. You know, at first I thought you were here delivering whiskey for our little celebration, but you don't look like one of the boys from the distillery either. The distillery. That was one of the reclaimed spaces, right? I forgot whether it was a distillery that was going to be turned into something else, or something else that was going to be turned into a distillery, but that was definitely one of the things. Uh, but what is this place? Well, it's clear you're new to this territory. I expect you just mean to be passing through. We're looking for Dogwood Drive. Do you know where that is? Dogwood. Nope. You're gonna need to talk to someone upstairs about that. One of the map clerks. But first, we've got to get you in the system, so you'll need an appointment with one of the ingestion clerks. Now, let's see. Rick has booked proofreading drafts all afternoon, and Wanda's out on a site. Uh, let me go make some calls and see if we have anyone free. Uh, there's some books over there in the waiting area. Or just take a look around. Have you seen our... Grotesques? What the hell's a grotesque? Sounds disturbing. The television is playing a cartoon about a bird. The cartoon bird collects pieces for its nest. A scarf, a plastic shopping bag, a bit of a young girl's hair. The nest is warm but precariously fragile. Playing what looks like a nature documentary. A hermit crab scuttles across a beach. Its shell is an awkward shape. It must have once belonged to a different crab. Were these TVs here before? I'm, I'm pretty sure they weren't. This is a strange, strange place. Or if they were here before, they weren't on. Instructional video on elevator design, it is crucial to maintain proper lighting in an elevator. In the absence of sight, the passenger's sense of motion is greatly enhanced. The passenger should never feel as though they are physically ascending or descending. The elevator should create the illusion that the building is flat. This is the mark of a successful elevator design. Playing a closed circuit security feed of a housing project, the feed switches mechanically between locations. A hallway, a disused plot of grass, a stairwell, a mailbox. A silent video of an empty theater. A microphone sits in the middle of the stage. The lights are slightly dimmed. The speakers hum impatiently. That static noise or water or whatever it is is getting louder and louder. It's overpowering, almost. Ah, it's a bit better over here. Back to the dribbling basketball. The sounds of this place really just give me a very strange feeling. Oh, good. I thought you'd left. People can be so impatient. You never know. Well, I have you meeting with Lulu, uh, Lula Chamberlain. She's a senior clerk and doesn't usually handle the ingestion process, but she's the only one with room on her plate this evening. My schedule says she's on the fifth floor reviewing some diagrams. The elevator is just back to the left there. Fifth floor. Thank you. It's really cool, by the way, when you click. I don't know if you've noticed. But when you click, and it shows you where you're going to, it's like this little game of horseshoe. It, like, throws a horseshoe at a... at a pole. It's a really cool little detail. Three books are piled on the table. A service manual for a sewage pump, some architectural plans for a bungalow, 
and a slim collection of Japanese death haiku. An envelope is protruding from the bottom of the stack. Hmm. Let's pick up the envelope. Bureau of Secret Tourism contains several small handwritten brochures with ritualistic directions to bizarre locations. What? Bureau of Secret Tourism? Huh? She's on the fifth floor, right? Conway scans a column of elevator buttons. Um, sorry, does this say on the third floor there's bears? Bears? Alright, fifth floor. I'm curious about the bears. What the, the It's literally a floor of bears. These are stalactites. We're in a cave. We are inside. Oh god. Much better. Still overpowering, though, and out of place. Craig is hard at work examining some diagrams, measuring angles with a plastic protractor and occasionally scribbling numbers in a small leather notebook. Can I help you? Uh, don't answer that. Are you Lula Chamberlain? Uh, no. You just missed her, actually. She was up here about an hour ago. She's probably back at her real desk now, on the first floor. She barely made a dent in these diagrams. Must have been distracted. But speaking of which... Yeah, yeah, I get the message. Okay, her office is down on the first floor. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm going to the bears. We're going to the bears. <laughs> they all watch me as I walk by. Excuse me, excuse me. Oh, there's Lula. Blue tie. Rick, uh, hello? Are you lost? We're looking for Lula Chamberlain. Oh, no, she's much too busy. Let's get some of our junior clerks to sort your paperwork first, so we don't waste any of Miss Chamberlain's time. It's a pretty straightforward process. First, you'll need to get a case number assigned. Talk to Clerk, uh, Metstein about that. She's just over there at the end of the room. Happy to help. This is some, like, bureaucratic nightmare. This feels like the start of a bureaucratic nightmare. Uh, hi. How are you? Fine, thanks. I just need your ingestion card and a list of your last five permanent addresses. Uh, I'm sorry. This is a bureaucratic nightmare. Uh, let's just skip it. Which one of you is Lulu Chamberlain? Sorry, Lula. Oh, sure. That's her in the cardigan. Yes. <laughs> Good. Good job, Shannon. 
Just got us the hell out of that mess. Having fun in the paperclip labyrinth? Well, you made it eventually. You look exhausted. I'd offer you my seat, but my ankles are turning on me. The receptionist said you could point us in the right direction. This concrete bunker of an office is just a waypoint for you, I'm sure. Where is it you're trying to go? Well, we're having trouble navigating the Zero. Just navigating? Apropos of nothing. The Zero doesn't work like other roads. You can't just drive and expect to find yourself somewhere. You must be more deliberate than when driving on surface roads. Ah. Huh. What is the Zero? What is this place? Not the specific building, but just the Zero and everything that spans from it. And, in a way, much less deliberate. We're looking for Dogwood Drive. Hmm, Dogwood Drive. That's funny. Do you know I used to live on a Dogwood Drive? This was years ago. A grimy old house, basement full of insects, attic full of birds. I had a few roommates. We all worked at the university. I had a dog. I drank whiskey and beer and made sculptures. But that dogwood was a surface road. With a name like that, it would have to be. What are you doing on the Zero? Uh, my cousin Weaver sent us this way. Your cousin Weaver? Weaver Marquez? I hadn't expected to hear from her again. Do you know her? She came through here as an intern. One of my old colleagues must have referred her. Do you know, I had never asked. Anyway, there's not much challenging work here. Much left, uh, much less for a gifted mathematician. She helped translate some notes on architectural plans I picked up in Mexico. She was very bored. We used to sit on the steps by the river on our lunch break and talk about geometry. I hope she wasn't in trouble. I lost touch with her so suddenly. I'd recommend she go see some old friends of mine at the university about a new acoustic surveying venture. I often worry she became wrapped up in some tenured professor's quixotic research project. You know the type. Gray-haired, intellectual, narcissistic. Well, that is... I guess she sent you here because she respected me. Thought I could help. Weaver's a dear girl, but I'm afraid you've been misled. Excuse me. But where's the dogwood drive you lived on? Maybe it's the same one. No, it's not possible. The Dogwood Drive I lived on is now called Pale Dogwood Drive. They've renamed all the streets, you see. Too many streets with the same names. It was never a problem before, but now we have these databases and it's all too confusing for the computer. The computer has no sense of ambiguity, so it proclaims an error. Name collisions, they call them. So my dogwood drive is pale dogwood drive, and another might be large leafed dogwood drive, or Himalayan flowering dogwood drive, and so on. But one of them is still just dogwood drive. Or so we might hope. It's really a matter of consulting records, of which we have an abundance here. Okay, uh, where's the computer? Computer? Oh, that's all handled off-site. We write up a formal request for analysis, provide the necessary data, and then send the whole thing out by courier. So, first you'll need the data. I expect you'll find the road name change log up in Archives and Records, fourth floor. It'll be filed under zero for odonyms, probably, or G for generic, or maybe S for specific, depending on which part of the street name was changed. Oh my god. What is this place? I don't understand. They don't have access to the records themselves? Like, they have to send a request? What? What is this? This is so strange. Alright, last save just now. Good. So, I think I'll end this episode here. I hope you've enjoyed so far. And when I return, I guess we're gonna try to dig up some records and find Dogwood Drive. <laughs>